Um, so I have uh, the pleasure of trying to introduce Asian opportunities to you in 15 minutes, which I think is a bit of a challenge given the fact that that's more than half the world. But anyway, I'll try. So uh, talking about opportunities and changing global landscape. First, let me just set the stage. Um, I'm going to be focusing mostly on North and Southeast Asia, because once you include places like India and the Middle East, it gets fuzzy. Um, there's about 2.1 billion people that live there, a billion internet users in essentially the Southeast Asia and North Asia space. That's about three and a half times, or maybe a bit more than three times the internet population uh, in the USA. Once you include India, just add another 350 million, no problem. Um, the one thing that I wanted to start off with though is give a little context about the opportunity because I grew up actually in Austria um, a long time ago. Um, and uh, I grew up with this narrative that Asia, particularly China, was the big opportunity. You know, sell a pair of shoes to a billion Chinese and you make billions of dollars. That was 30, 40 years ago. But I've seen how that narrative has changed. And suddenly the narrative has changed into it's too hard to do business in China. It's too difficult to do business in Japan. The culture is so different. We'll lose our shirts piracy, you know, our, our software will be copied. And it's become almost like doing business in an alien planet. So today what I'm trying to do is help you maybe break down some of those stereotypes and discuss the opportunities for this up and coming generation. So first, I want to go to a little bit of a history lesson. So bear with me for a few minutes. And it starts over 150 years ago or so with immigration. The first group of Chinese and Japanese people who basically left China because of wars and all sorts of um, terrible, terrible situations back home to America, building railroads. They immigrated and they tried to assimilate with the culture. That was 150 years ago plus. And when they came to America, they brought with them culture. But interestingly enough, it wasn't just the Asian culture. They brought with them essentially a mashup form of culture. This is a fortune cookie, as you probably all know, except nobody in China eats this stuff. Actually, nobody in Asia eats it. But it's become the stereotype image of Chinese food, right? It's together with the pink sheets and all that kind of soy sauce. Actually, in North China, nobody uses soy sauce. However, uh, the idea that this is Asian is because actually a Japanese person invented this about 100 years ago and said, you know what, we need to create more popularity for our Asian food and created the fortune cookie. Well, and, um, you know, take some ingenuity to think about putting some, you know, something written on a piece of paper inside a baked cookie. But this has become the image of a first form of mashup culture, where it starts with the food. And now, of course, you can see that in other ways, where Chinese food is very popular in, 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 uh, in Europe and the US, and of course, Japanese food as well. And <clears throat> one of the things that's happened, though, of course, with the spread of the Asian diaspora, if you look at, for instance, just the Chinese population, the number of Chinese that live as permanent citizens outside of China is greater than the population of the United Kingdom and Ireland put together, and it's growing. So it's basically a country. And what that also does is they spread with it their culture, and they spread with that the mindsets. And with, with it also, they become actually very westernized. But these Chinese come back, and in China we call them sea turtles. These sea turtles are basically the travelers who go abroad, bring western ideas, bring concepts, and then bring them back home. And they're very highly sought in, in China because they have expertise, they have knowledge, they get paid more, and they're also very good marriage prospects. Anyway, what happens though is, of course, that when they go back, they don't only just bring, you know, American culture like McDonald's or TV like Friends, which is very popular in China. But what they also do is they bring ideas, ideas about freedom or liberty, ideas about design. All these ideas come back with them. So when they study abroad, they don't just come back with know-how. They come back with values values that are very similar to the values that all of you are familiar with in the West. And so one of the first stereotypes that I would like to sort of address is this narrowing culture gap. Now, when people talk about it's so hard to do business in Asia, we don't understand it, we, don't, we need to localize. Yes, there's a degree of localization involved. But actually, it's a fairly narrowing cultural gap. So maybe 20, 30 years ago, that was very true. But today, it's changed a lot. And I'll give you some examples exactly why that is. So this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, this is uh, Ren Ren on the, uh, the right. It's basically a clone of Facebook. And this is the, you know, it's, a, it's about seven or eight years old, uh, this image. Uh, and they just basically copied Facebook wholesale, right? I mean, just completely copied it uh, when they first launched. And it was a huge success on the web at the time. 
And what was interesting is that because you know, it's a classic example of what people fear with the Chinese space. They just say, oh, I'm, you know, I have a product, and then the Chinese just copy it really fast, and whoa, you know, they take the business away. But what's interesting here is that this model is only possible because the design that Facebook came up, which is, you could say, a Western design principle, you know, with you know, the formatting, you know, it's not like top-down writing or anything like that, is possible because of all of the sea turtles and the culture and the influence that Chinese people from overseas have brought back with them. So they're expecting, essentially, Western design, if you will. But the other thing that I like about this as well is that this was seven or eight years ago. And if you look at the design of Renren versus Facebook in the same time gap, you'll actually notice that Facebook looks a lot like Renren. And you see the ideas where the ads are placed and where the games are played and so on. I mean, they were playing games on Renren way before Zynga and Farmville. So it's an example where these kind of ideas can cross over. And of course, nobody at Facebook will probably ever admit that they were inspired by a copycat, but it's quite likely that they probably looked at that and said, hey, that's not a bad idea. Maybe I'll take that as well. And that is one of the early forms where mashup can happen, not just in one direction, but in both directions as well. The other example I want to give is um, Xiaomi. So every one of you have probably heard about Xiaomi. Xiaomi is one of the big Chinese sort of unicorn stories worth $40, $50 billion, uh, and one of the biggest smartphone makers in the world, and the number one smartphone maker in China today. What's interesting is that they used Android as their platform. In fact, if you look at China, 70% of the smartphone market, or 80% of the smartphone market is really effectively Android at this point. And they modified a design from you know, basically Google, from Android, and basically launched a, the MIUI, which is with its own app store, with everything that you expect to see, based on Android. And again, here could be an example where you look at it and say, oh, again, the Chinese copied something, they adapted it for the local market, and then just rolled it out and are taking over the Chinese market, not leaving any space or opportunity for people from the outside. But perhaps the other way to look at it is that now, everyone who develops on Android just expanded the market by about 500 million users. Because if you've made the app for Android, you can now actually launch it on Xiaomi, on Lenovo, and on Huawei. And they're on different app stores. It's not Google Play. It's a different kind of app store. But they're looking for your content. And particularly in the area of games, for instance, it has proven very successful. Games that used to be popular in, um, in the West before could never succeed in a marketplace like Asia, or China particularly. And now it works out quite well. You know, games like Temple Run or Fruit Ninja are great runaway successes in the Chinese market. And the kind of localization that they had to do was not as sort of radical as most people expect. Because they're using interfaces and designs that are familiar with. The back button is the same. The design is the same. I make the app. The kind of localization I have to do is not that difficult. So again, it's becoming more narrow. So the, and there's multiple examples of that. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that's changing in not just in all of Asia, but particularly in China, is the ultra-competitive domestic landscape. Uh, I read a recent report that talked about you know, that there were 167 unicorns in the world right now. Well, they forgot about China, because China alone has 150 of them. Some, and many of them are public. But of course, we don't know about them because we don't track the, you know, the Shanghai index, or we don't track the Shenzhen index. But these are all companies that have cash. And these are all companies that are investing in R&D. And the difference is that, again, 20 years ago, those companies maybe were monopolies run by state-owned enterprises. And these monopolies basically said, well, if you want to do business in China, you've got to work with me. You don't have a choice. So, it was, so that monopoly model made it unable for someone to enter, and it gave someone an unfair competitive advantage for the, for the Chinese market. But now, with an ultra-competitive landscape like this, where you have basically almost the same number of unicorns in terms of funding, and many more mid-sized companies, if you will, that are fighting for the same users, fighting for the same customers, fighting for the same market segment. The competition is fierce. So the commodity, uh, the commodity that basically is, is, is precious is time. It's not access. Access used to be the precious commodity. Now it's time. So a Chinese, competitive, uh, Chinese company can no longer afford to wait two years to copy you or clone you to launch into the market because someone else might license the technology from one of you guys or from some company in the US and basically launch to market nine months faster and crush them. That is the, that's the reality. And the result of that, of course, is that many of those Chinese companies, and this is just a snapshot, and also Japanese and Korean companies are investing outwards. They're buying companies overseas. 
they're investing overseas very actively. Even if you look recently, the news about Angelist's new $400 million fund, it came from a Chinese venture capital firm. It didn't come from an American or European one, it came from a Chinese firm. And if you look at, for instance, big companies like Riot Games, it's effectively owned by Tencent. They don't probably want you to know that it's Chinese owned, but still, it is. But they let them run by themselves because they want the knowledge that they have to bring back into their particular marketplace. And that is very important from an opportunity standpoint. So you can look for investors in the Asian space as well. Now, of course, Asia is not only a place where you could enter as a market and where people are looking for ideas from the West. Uh, and while this is only one measure, one of the recent sort of patent filing measures, if you look, the top, the top five countries of patent submissions were from Asian countries. Number two, number three, and number five. Japan, China, and Korea. And there's a lot of ideas and innovation that are coming in that space that can cross over, just like I showed you before in the Renren Facebook example. So early examples of crossing the other way is, of course, happening in culture, whether it's food, like everyone loves sushi, everyone loves Chinese food, everyone, a lot of you probably have watched sort of manga or anime. Um, and of course, many of you have played on a PlayStation 4 or in the earlier generations of the Nintendo. So you, all of you already have had access to sort of an Asianized culture. You know, 20 years ago, cute was not cool. Now, cute is kind of cool because of Hello Kitty or because of all the Japanese drawings and the big eyes. You've gotten used to it, right? You see it in the cartoons, you see it everywhere. But that wasn't the case before. So every one of you is becoming slightly more Asian as a result. But of course, it's, it happens also the other way around, right? Many of the guys in, in China and in Asia are actually much more westernized. Now, the other example I want to give you is WeChat. Many of you may have heard of it, but all of you probably use WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. The thing about WeChat is, this is a model of where messaging will go. And expect Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp to completely follow this. You can buy your insurance, you can make doctor's appointments, you can do everything on WeChat uh, that you basically Facebook Messenger wants to do. And clearly, WeChat was first. They have 600 million users, hugely influential. And again, it's just an example that when you come out to the Asian market space, maybe you don't have to do business there, but you can get ideas as well, and you can interact with local developers or local people to get inspiration for your own market. Because looking at that space, it's not just about taking ideas from the West and bringing it into the East, it's about mashing it up in the other way around as well. Finally, I want to close with uh, this uh, quote um, from John Huntsman, who was a previous, um, previous ambassador to China. There are now uh, more people learning Chinese Ah, uh, sorry, learning English in China than there are Americans in the United States. Right. So now, of course, there's a lot of people in China, so maybe it's not a big deal. However, China, the thing about China is its connectedness to the world is not going to be because all of us will suddenly learn Chinese 20 or 30 years ago. It's because the Chinese will learn English, of course. And the opportunity is that you can communicate into that market. In fact, for those of you who have been to Shanghai for the last 10 years, the level of English has been rocketing up. It's not an alien planet. You can communicate with them. Yeah, there's a few idiosyncrasies, but it's becoming less and less different. It's becoming almost like the difference between you know, UK and Italy. Okay, maybe not quite there yet, but in about 10 years' time, it won't feel that different. You can go to a Starbucks, you can go to a McDonald's, you can talk about your favorite TV series, you mash up and you share the culture. So in closing, I would like to invite all of you to consider the Asian market space. Uh, not necessarily for business entry, but also to understand and to look at opportunities, whether it's investment, whether it's market opportunities, whether it's, um, whether it's just getting inspiration for your own market. Uh, because it is my belief that in the future, we're going to be seeing the big companies of the future are going to be the ones that take the best from the East and the West and bring it together. It's not going to be a Western company taking over the East or an Eastern company taking over the West. That, to me, I think, is a slightly outdated model. And if you want to learn more, that happens to be a Rise booth, not an intended, blue, not an intended plug, but Rise booth is uh, just around the corner. Thank you.